There we go. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. I'll keep an eye on the um, um, on the doorbell in case others are still jumping into the call. But welcome to tonight's um, webinar. Um, it's held by CKO Sprint regarding ONCA and by and amendments to your bylaws as not-for-profit organizations in Ontario. Um, my name is Michelle Bishop, and I am the um, secretary of the board for CKO Sprint. Um, and we recently went through our bylaw review and update um, to ensure ANCA compli compliance and pass those bylaws in November at our annual general meeting. So it is something we knew that lots of clubs were wrestling with ahead of this coming fall's deadline. Um, and um, uh, Stephen Ng from Sport Law um, helped us through the process and we talked to Stephen about putting on a webinar for all the Ontario clubs that were trying to wrestle their way through the exact same process and figure out what changes and updates uh, were required um, in order to be compliant ahead of the deadline. So thank you Stephen for joining us and for for putting on the webinar and being willing to take everybody through it. So um, uh, Stephen has some um, an opening presentation we'll go through to talk about some of the highlights of the, the legislation and its requirements and how you might be affected. Um, then uh, we will have uh, questions and answers. Um, if you can turn on your camera because of bandwidth, please do so. Um, and when you ask questions, um, just make sure to introduce yourself and the club that you're with as you do that. Um, Stephen, anything else opening or? If no, not, you? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take over. Thanks, Michelle. Really appreciate you putting this together to help uh, the clubs within Ontario become ONCA compliant. As Michelle said, my name's Stephen Digg. I'm a lawyer with Sport Law. We are an organization that has been around 32 years working exclusively in the amateur sport community. For those of you who have never been to our website, we have over 600 articles of that talk about a lot of topics in sport, including ONCA and the requirements of ONCA. I also want to thank Mike and Olivia, who are uh, my team members that we all work together on bylaws and uh, and ONCA stuff. So really happy that they could be here to attend as well. So if you want to learn more about the company, it's uh, the contact information is at the end. It's sportlaw.ca. It's a pretty easy website, and uh, please take a look at that. My presentation style is pretty loose and easygoing. So if you do have a question, uh, Michelle will either moderate that question through the chat box or we'll find a time to answer your, your query if you have your hand up. If those of you who are uncomfortable about asking your question in a publicly recorded forum, um, by all means, pop me an email that I'll share with you at the end of the session and we can find a time or an opportunity to chat about what your your you know your individual concerns can be. Again, if you're comfortable <clears throat> leaving your, your camera on, I do appreciate it. it. It is far easier to present to people than it is to letters and uh, acronyms. So again, thank you for that. What we're gonna talk about tonight is ONCA <clears throat> and a little bit of bylaws because a lot of what ONCA requires is not necessarily that complicated, but what we're finding is we're offering three different packages to organizations if they want to become ONCA compliant. In order to be compliant, we need to see two things happen. Your bylaws have to be updated to comply with the legislation and you have to file your articles of amendment. You have to, in essence, refile your articles of incorporation to include three things. You have to include the definition of a member. You have to include the voting conditions of membership as well as the dissolution clause if you were to close your organization, what do you do with the millions and millions of dollars that you all have in your bank account at the time of dissolution? So those are the three things that, the two things that we need to see to get to completion. So I, I will talk about ANCA, but also a little bit of bylaw work because the three areas that we're offering for uh, completion is one, we just update your bylaws, file your articles of amendment. Option two is, wow, your bylaws are on type written font from 1982. We probably need to give you a new draft and file your articles of amendment. 
Or option three, which a lot of our organizations are engaging, is actually doing a governance review, looking at membership, looking at voting rights, looking at board composition and portfolios and terms associated with those. So those are the, the three different services that we're offering. And that's why I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of your bylaws and how we can help moder modernize them. So Anka actually came into conversation October 25th, 2010. And actually shortly after that announcement, we started advocating to the sport community. You have to update your bylaws. You have to update your bylaws to comply with Anka. And then it sat on the legislation's desk for 11 years. And there was some minor amendments that were made to the proposed legislation from 2010 to the legislation that was passed October 19th in 2021. So what we're talking about, and this has come up in some of the presentations that I've done, what we are talking about and who this applies to is Ontario not-for-profit corporations. You are a registered not-for-profit corporation. If you are an unincorporated entity, this is not applicable to you. If you are a federally incorporated entity, this is not applicable to you. Those of you who are operating programs as an unincorporated entity, please call me and I'll tell you why that's a very bad idea. I very much advocate for incorporation to protect the individual volunteers from liability uh, that you see in an unincorporated entity. The law recognizes two things, people and corporations. And when we have a corporation, the people inside that corporate shield, that corporate sh uh, circle, are protected from liability as long as they're acting in the best interests of the corporation. So again, this what we're talking about today is, is incorporated not-for-profit entities. If you are unsure of your status, uh, pop me an email. I can find out really quickly. It's a free search to let you know if you are incorporated. Also, you can, uh, those of you who don't have your corporate documents, like your articles of incorporation or your letters patent, depending on when you were registered, we can also find out that information for the low, low cost of $3 is what the ministry is charging to get a copy of your governing documents. So those of you who are incorporated, you have three years to comply with ONCA, which will be March 19th, 2024. So in about six months, there'll be an obligation to comply with ONCA. In 2014, the federal government actually did this same, uh, same practice. They updated the legislation and told them they had three years to comply. But what the federal government said was after three years is, is if you do not transition, file the proper paperwork, update your bylaws, you will be dissolved. We will strike you from the corporate record. In Canada, in, Canada, in Ontario, they're not doing that. What they are saying is if you do not uh, transition after three years, you will be deemed to have transitioned. And what that means is you'll end up in what I call the gray zone. Your bylaws will say A, the legislation will say B. You will have that member call you out on that and it'll put you in a very difficult position. So we'll walk through all the uh, obligations of Anka through the presentation, but really what the intent of of today is, and as you move forward over the next six months, is to make sure that they, we remove that gray zone and have you comply. Those of you who have done any sort of research in this area, you would find probably default bylaws that were created by the government. Those default bylaws do not automatically become your bylaws October 19, 2024. Those default bylaws are only legally applicable to new corporations that do not pass bylaws within 60 days of incorporation. So if we, I mean, who can I pick on? I always try to pick on somebody. I'll say, hi, Brian, it's okay I pick on you? So if Brian says I want to incorporate today. Thank you, Brian. If Brian says I want to incorporate today, then we have to work over the next 60 days to have the board and the membership pass bylaws. If we don't do that, the default bylaws will prevail. If you read the default bylaws, depending on the size of your organization, it could be, it could have very dramatic effects on, on your organization. Majority of a member's meeting is, uh, sorry, quorum of a member's meeting is a majority of people. Well, majority at a member's meeting is very difficult to ascertain, in my opinion. 
So there are a lot of different provisions in the default bylaws that I don't like and that I don't think are very good for sport. So do be very cautious if you just simply adopt them. I urge you to read them. I have to be honest, I don't really like them as a default provision or a starting point, but they are available to you. The original piece of legislation, yeah. And Andrea had a hand up. Andrea, did you want to jump in? Is your question still pertinent? Yeah, I just, I wanted to know, I mean, so we are, uh, Bum so Bombay Beach Canoe Club, and we're not, um, we're not incorporated ourselves, but we are um, a sports division of a corporation. And so we were planning to just amend to make sure that it's aligned with, but I mean, do the same requirements apply? Um, I, I figured not. Okay, thank no, you. No, it would apply to your, your, you know, the way I would view yeah. you, you're a division of, a committee of, a program yeah. of, it would be the responsibility of the of. The of to uh, to to make compliance with this yeah that's great thank you anything else michelle anybody else nope that's it for now okay the original piece of legislation is called the ontario corporations act it was written in 1907 yes a few things have changed over the last 120 years and one of those things of course is the internet and the electronic process the intent behind ONCA was to simplify the filings, the registration, the management of a corporation, and also it made things more restrictive. The Ontario Corporations Act would say things like, notice of an AGM will be in accordance with your bylaws. Removal of a director will be in accordance with your bylaws. Quorum will be in accordance with your bylaws. And what ONCA did was they said, no, it's not gonna be in accordance with your bylaws. We're gonna tell you the notice provision for a members meeting, the number of members required to requisition a meeting. We're going to take away that thinking for you and make it legislative. And the other significant change is on the financial reporting requirements. And I will spend some time there because I think it's a significant shift for some organizations when we start talking about mandatory audits or mandatory review engagements or mandatory the appointment of accountants, which might not be something you're normally used to doing. So we'll walk through that as we go through the process. The first thing that you need to do is get access to the Ontario Business Registry. So when ONCA was launched October 19, 2021, the entire filing system for um, the entire filing system for corporate documents became electronic. And in order to do your filings, like your notice of change, some of you might be familiar with, or your annual return, or your form one, um, changing your board composition, or your head office address, that all changed October 19, 2021. You have to do that online. In order to get your online profile, you need a corporate key. It is a nine digit number from the ministry. It's like your password. In order to do that, you have to request it. You have to go on to the link below and click on it, find your corporation. And it's going to ask you for the last postal code that is registered with the ministry. Now, what we're finding with all the Onco work that we're doing is most organizations have not kept up to date with their filings with the ministry. And that postal code might be a president or a secretary from 20 years ago. So you either have two things have to happen. You have to find out that last postal code. And two, you have to have access to that postal code because they will mail the nine digit key to that address. If you have absolutely no idea the last time a filing was done, or you have no idea whose postal code it is, even if you do know it, we can help you get your company key through an updated corporate profile search. The deficiency with that is rather than being free, we pay a $100 filing fee, which we then have to circle back to the client. So if you are struggling getting your key, we can help you pull your corporate record, update it electronically. And when you've updated your profile electronically with an email address, they will email the key to that address. So we're doing a lot of this work because we're finding people don't know the last time a report was done. I did a client today, the last filing was 1992. 
They had no idea whose postal code was on file. They paid the hundred dollars. We got the key an hour later. Usually when we put it in, it uh, spits out the key in about 10 minutes after. So really important, you can't do any of the Anka transition without this key. And like I said before, those of you who have struggle finding it, uh, please let us know. We can help you. We can help you track that key down. I remember you had to help us when we were going through the process, and it was the it was the mailing address of a previous board secretary who no longer sat on the board, but thankfully still lived in the same house, and we had to have it mailed to her. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. In order to complete the Anka transition, we have to go into this profile and we have to file your articles of amendment electronically. The other thing I do want to add, since we're spending money, the filing fee on an articles of amendment is $130. There are 6,000 sport clubs in Ontario who have to pay that $130. Talk to your MP. A couple things that uh, some changes introduced under Anka. So as I said before, your membership structure and your voting rights have to be outlined in the articles. And again, I alluded to the federal government back in 2014. And to be quite honest with you, they made it very simple. They actually, on the form, they said, question one, answer, question two, answer, question three, answer. What they've done in Ontario is none of the above. It says, do you have any special provisions? So if you don't know what you're doing, or where to add it, it can be very complicated. So under the special provision section of the Articles of Incorporation is where you're going to include your membership structure and your voting rights in the articles. And you have to also include your dissolution clause. And I know it's interesting, I've been doing this 22 years with probably over a thousand sport organizations. And for the first 21 years of my career, I never did a dissolution, never happened. We just kept growing and growing and growing. And just this calendar year, I've already done three of them where volunteers are just getting too tired to say, no one wants to take over, we're gonna close the corporation. The dissolution clause is super important to understand. The default provision in legislation is equally amongst the members at the time of dissolution. And where we're seeing this as a significant issue is particularly organizations who own property curling clubs, golf courses, who particularly in Toronto might have a downtown property that's worth $20 million for a new uh, sky rise development of condos and apartments. And the members are going, absolutely, let's dissolve. And they're going to get $125,000 in their pocket. So we like the default provision of, de of dissolution to be um, to a charity or not for profit rather than distributing it amongst the members, particularly somebody like a Brian who could have been a member for 20 years in an organization, stopped being a member in year 21 and they dissolved and he would get nothing because he gave up his membership. So again, something to think about. I know we hope you never close, but do think about if you did and you were sitting on some significant assets, how do we want to deal with those assets? You might have heard when Anka was created in, in 2000 and uh, in 2010 that they were going to give voting rights to non-voting classes. And that's a significant risk in sport when we talk about, depending on the sport, the, the number of people that are in, uh, in the association. We do work with Oakville Soccer Club. They have 14,000 individual participants. So giving voting rights to a potential non-voting class could be significant. They actually didn't pass that. That got taken out of the legislation when they amended it between 2010 and 2021. So it is okay to have your regular member, your associate member, your non-voting members, your honorary members, if you still want to keep that, that number of classes. Don't worry about the fact that uh, they, would have, uh, they would not have voting rights. Members have the ability to put a proposal forward at the annual general meeting and special meetings of members. 10% uh, of members can requisition a meeting for anything related to the operations of the corporation. And the actual definition of a member's proposal is submitted. This is where it gets really interesting. 90 days prior to the anniversary of last year's annual general meeting. Everyone got that? So a member's proposal can be submitted 90 days in advance of the anniversary of the last AGM. Most of the time when we write bylaws, we do not use that language because nobody understands it. 
we usually will say a member can make a proposal within 30 or 60 days of the members meeting. And that gives the board an opportunity or the staff an opportunity to review what the query might be and maybe to uh, have some conversations in advance of having a vote. ONCA also allows for electronic meetings. It also allows for absentee voting by mail, by online, and in addition to proxies. One of the significant changes between the Ontario Corporations Act and the ONCA Act is that proxy voting is now optional. It used to be mandatory. Those of you who wrote into your bylaws no proxies, you're actually in breach of the current legislation. ONCA will give you flexibility of whether or not you want to allow for proxies. So that's again another thing to contemplate in the review of your bylaws. There's new eligibility requirements for directors. It's still pretty simple and I'll walk through that in a minute. And there's also some flexibility on the minimum number of directors and the maximum number of directors. Again, the current legislation actually says you need to have a fixed number. You have to say, we will have seven directors, we will have nine. ONCA allows you to say in your bylaws, we will have minimum three, maximum nine, but the number still has to be fixed by the members or by the board if the members have granted the, the board that authority. So when you file your articles of amendment, in that document, it'll actually say minimum directors, maximum directors, or a fixed number. I highly recommend a min and a max because what's happening is if CKO Sprint says we're going to have a board of seven and you only list six directors with the ministry, Michelle will get a letter from the ministry saying, you've said you're going to have seven, you only have six, go find that seventh. If you say minimum of three, maximum of nine, and we're in that wheelhouse, we won't hear from the ministry at all. So even though you may have a fixed number in your bylaws, I do recommend in the articles giving yourself that discretion of going to a smaller board or a larger board uh, without having to update your articles of amendment because you have a fixed number in there. And again, every time we update the articles, 130 bucks, 130 bucks, 130 bucks uh, filing fee. We're gonna get into the financial reporting. So there are three different types of subcategories of incorporations. So if you are charitable, which likely none of you are because it's very complicated and difficult for a sport organization to get charitable status outside of the national level. So if you're charitable, you're in the highest standard of financial reporting. The second, the second highest standard is what we call non-charitable public benefit. And what this means is you've received $10,000 or more in government grants or donations from non-members, directors, officers, or employees. You need to watch this number, and I'll show you why in a second. So most of you, some of you might be getting Trillium or lotteries or bingo. This would all start counting towards that $10,000 threshold. And if you are deemed a public benefit corporation, you will have that status for two fiscal years. So if we got 10 grand today, and our year end was December 31st, we would be a public benefit corp this year, 2024 and 2025. If we don't receive that $10,000 in government grants and donations, we're deemed non-public benefit. And this is why it's important. ONCA is now mandating and dictating the type of financial reporting you must provide to your members. So if you receive, if your revenue, okay, not profit, not what's left at the end of the year, what comes into the bank account is $100,000 or less, but we get $10,000 in public funding. We have to ask, we have to do a review engagement and we have to have an auditor. That will cost you likely between three and $5,000 to do that with an accountant. There's a new form of resolution that you all have to be comfortable with or knowledge about. So your ordinary resolution is a majority vote, six out of 10. A two thirds vote special resolution would be you know, seven out of 10. A new one is called an extraordinary resolution. It's 80% of votes cast. And the only time you'll ever use it 
is to dumb down the financial reporting requirement. So as a standing item at your AGMs, you will want to ask for this motion if you want to reduce your financial reporting obligations. So again, if I'm $100,000 and $99,000 in revenue, I get $10,000 in public funding, I am going to ask my members all in favor of waiving the requirement of an auditor and all in favor of not doing a review engagement or an audit and saving three to $10,000. We can do that. Now, if our revenue is half a million dollars or more, and we're a publicly funded organization, we must do an audit. And I'm telling you, I've been hearing this over and over again. A lot of organizations are saying, we get $11,000 in grants, but it's gonna cost us 15,000 to do an audit. Exactly. We need to start paying attention. Is it worth accepting the grant because of the, now the new financial obligations of reporting that we have to do? If you don't get that $10,000 in government funding, your revenue is $500,000 or less. You again can dispense with the auditor, dispense with the audit and the review engagement with that extraordinary resolution. If you're over $500,000, you don't get that $10,000 in grants. You have to have an auditor and you have to at minimum do a review engagement. So there could be some new expenditures there that some of you may not be used to, depending on the source of your income, depending on the source of the grants, and depending on what kind of financial reporting you do. Go ahead, Michelle, you were going to say something. Yeah, just quick question with respect to the um, $10,000 in government funding. Um, is it for the purpose of this law just government funding from the Ontario government or does funding from the federal government or even a local municipality Both. also count? All of the okay. above. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I know this is a heavy section. So before I move on, does anybody have a, a point of clarification or a question? This is usually a pretty new new topic for some people. So some of you might not be working with an accountant. You're not filing a tax return. You're supposed to. I don't think CRA is coming in looking for you know little you know paddling clubs or any smaller sport organizations or a bigger fish to fry. But again, I'd be remiss not to tell you, um, you should. It. What happens if we don't do the review? There's no such thing as corporate police. Um, so it's not like you need to report your financial uh, revenue to the government, to, to the Ministry of Ontario, you do not. You do have to, you're supposed to do it to CRA. If you don't do it, I, I really think you're going to end up having a deficiency with your members for those of, or those who are informed of what's supposed to be done and trying to justify why you didn't do what was supposed to be done by legislation. That's kind of my further expansion of what I was calling the gray zone before. So, yeah. There was another question, Michelle, I kind of popped and, up at the bottom. Andrea asked if we would get a copy of the slides. Oh, absolutely. I will PDF this and send it to you, Michelle. You can send it out to everybody. Oh, for yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, some other membership issues I think you should be aware. As I mentioned before, if your bylaws don't state the voting mechanism, that'll be one vote per member. You may not want to have one vote per member. Notice of an AGM must be 10 to 50 days. If your bylaws do not speak of quorum, it will be a majority of members. From my experience, dealing with small clubs to clubs that have thousands and thousands of members, most people are averaging a solid seven people coming to their AGM. So you really want to be careful as to where you set your quor your quorum because you can't pass a motion or a resolution without quorum. So really important that you set it. I like low numbers. Um, again, I've worked with organizations that have 6,000, 10,000 members. We say quorum's 15 because nobody comes. And we do have to send notice to all our members. And if they choose not to come, that's their their prerogative, but it shouldn't hamper the organization from moving forward. As mentioned before, members may requisition a meeting with 10% of the vote support of the members. Uh, also indicated before, proxy voting is optional. If you do want to allow for proxies, you probably will, you can maximize the uh, 
the return, it has to be maximum 48 hours before the AGM. You can't say submitted seven days in advance, 10 days advance. It can be a maximum of 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Another significant change, and it ties back to the financial reporting we just spoke about. Most of you are probably used to attending members meetings and you walk in and on a table is the agenda. Um, and then there's some reports and there's the financial statements. And then nine minutes later, we ask everybody to vote on them. Anka is now saying that your financial reports have to be ready between five and 21 days in advance of the members meeting. Those financial statements have to be approved by the director and have a report of the auditor attached to it. Again, if you're required to have an auditor. So part of our intake and our governance work that we've been doing with clients is really having conversations with them and saying, when's your AGM, when's your fiscal year end? And if you do have to work with an auditor or an accountant to get your, your financials done, how much time do you need? And most accountants will tell you they need probably between two and four months to prepare your financial statements, depending on the year in which you're doing them or the time of year if you're doing them in your, in your year end. So really significant to uh, recognize that they have to be ready in advance and not just something that they see as they show up. The eligibility of a director, you have to be an individual. You can't be a representative of a corporation. You have to be over 18. You have to uh, be of sound mind as decided by the Substitute Decision Act or the Mental Health Act. We always kind of make a joke there. It's not our personal opinions of whether somebody's sane or not. It is defined by legislation. And you can't be in the status of bankrupt. A new thing under ONCA, and I really like this to be quite honest with you, directors do not have to be members. It could be people who have a vested interest or a skill set that you might want to leverage, even though they might not paddle. I think that's okay. And I've seen, I could share lots of stories about why I think that's relevant. But I always like to say, we have lots of people who probably know how to paddle. We probably don't have too many people who know law, marketing, fundraising, sponsorship, all the other things that we're required to do to make a sport organization operate. So you can say you must be a member, but I, one of my favorite words in governance is flexibility. And I really like having flexibility. But again, that's a, a subjective decision. You have to have at all times three directors. If you ever fall below three directors, you should call a members meeting ASAP to get that third uh, person. Another change that you'll see in the bylaw writing that we do and is required under ONCA is that a director must consent in writing to be a director. And kind of saw that and started laughing and saying, really? like people don't know. I actually got a call a couple months ago from a longtime client saying, hi, Steve, guess what happened last night? And I said, oh, I don't know what happened. He said, I got voted president of an organization that I didn't know I was running for. I was like, wow, that's uh, congratulations. So in order to run as a director, you need to have written consent. You need to maintain that consent. And the maximum term of a director without being reelected is four years. So you can have a four-year term as a, as, a, as a director subject to re-election. If you choose to cap the number of terms a director can sit, that's subjective. That's not something mandated by legislation. There are three ways, I was gonna say three ways in which a person can come become a director. The first is ex officio, and I wanna make sure everyone's clear on that definition. It's not non-voting. There is no such thing as a non-voting director. Everybody who's a director is a director, has the right to vote. Ex officio means that I, because I hold this position, I get that position. And I'll pick on Michelle here. If Michelle was the president of CKO Sprint and Canoe Kayak Ontario said that the president of CKO Sprint automatically gets a position on the provincial board, that's ex officio. It's not Michelle who's the, the director, it's any person who holds that position of president of CKO Sprint. So we don't need to have an election up here. If Michelle transition and Brian transitions in, he becomes the director. The second way in which you can become a director is by election. There is no longer any such thing as acclamation. 
the members still need to approve the election of a director by majority vote. I have actually been at a very predominant meeting in sport with hundreds of people where there was one candidate running for election. I was the scrutineer. I got to count all the votes and come back in front of 300 people and say, sorry, Mr. Smith, you did not get the number of votes required to be elected. Not only did they not want you, they wanted nobody. Um, so I have seen that happen. So again, just because you're the only person running doesn't mean the membership have to accept you. It's up to them. The third way in which you become a director is by appointment. But the appointment comes with a caveat. It's based on a one-third rule. In order to appoint one director for a one-year term, we have to elect three at the last AGM. In order to appoint two, we have to elect six. In order to appoint three, we have to elect nine. And those appointments are for a one-year term subject to renewal. Um, if you are a public benefit corporation, no more than one-third of your board can be employees. That's probably not a big concern for us in sport. The statutory, the statutory duty of care of a director is now embedded in legislation. It used to be uh, determined by case law, the way we've interpreted decisions over the years within court system. Now it's to, it's defined in legislation. And I really like this because I think it helps set a framework for common language amongst directors to act honestly in good faith in the best interests of the corporation, exercising the reasonable care and diligence and skill of a person in a similar circumstance. I know that's a mouthful, but really what we're trying to say is if you have education or designations, you can't, you can't say, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you my opinion. You have to, and you have to make decisions in the best interest of the entity and not necessarily, you know, your family or your child. It's about what's best for the organization. So I really like setting that out. There's also better protection for directors in the legislation. The old Ontario Corporations Act actually said in order to ascertain indemnification, which means being put back in the same position prior to litigation financially, required members approval. We would do that through bylaw ratification. We would say the board will be indemnified for acting in the best interest of the corporation subject to litigation. ANCA includes that in the legislation, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. ANCA is also very specific on conflict of interest. Conflict of interest means uh, from an ANCA perspective, and of course there's a larger definition when we look outside of legislation, if you're to receive a financial benefit, you are to disclose that conflict, note it in the minutes that you've disclosed it. Here's the kicker, remove yourself from attending, discussing, and voting on the matter. It's not enough for Brian to say, I'm in a conflict, I'll just sit here, I won't vote. No, Brian, you've, you've, you've indicated the conflict. We're voting on whether your daughter gets a scholarship to go to a travel event. You have to leave this conversation. And we note that in the minutes. So it's very specific on the, on the, on the conflict of interest management. Steve, um, uh, question, because this is an issue for a lot of our clubs. We are volunteer organizations and a lot of the board members are parents um, whose kids are still actively paddling. Um, if, if people leave due to conflict, do we lose quorum? Or if we had quorum at the beginning of the meeting to start the meeting, is it okay if we lose quorum because they recuse themselves? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's provisions in the act that speak to that when, when there's uh, too many people in conflict. So yeah, there's stuff in there, Michelle, to, to okay. adequately advise. Okay. So another change, most of you are probably familiar again with amending your bylaws requires a two thirds vote, a special resolution that has changed. Anka has actually said, that in order to amend your bylaws, you only need a majority vote, an ordinary resolution, again, except if the change is in this list. So if we're changing the name of the corporation from ABC to DEF, that change would require a two-thirds vote. 
If we are changing or killing off a class of membership, that requires a two thirds vote. So what you need to do as we do further bylaw changes, once you've adopted ONCA, is you'll say, oh, okay, we're doing some amendments here in 2027, 2028. Does it fall within this list? Because if it does, it requires a two thirds vote and not a majority vote. So it's really significant. I actually had a client get caught on this a couple of weeks ago and, and that person did write a letter to the organization saying, I don't think you had the right resolution. It should have been two thirds. You didn't get that. Therefore, the motion should have failed. So now we end up in the gray zone. We're trying to work it out with the with the client and the and the member to make sure that everything is done the correct way. So when we do bylaw work, when we update your bylaws to comply with ONCA, we actually copy this slide, embed it into your bylaws under the bylaw amendment section. We say all bylaw amendments are ordinary resolution except this list, which requires a special resolution. That way you don't have to go chasing definitions in the, uh, in the act. So some preliminary steps, uh, gather your governing documents. If we, what we always ask for, your company key, your articles of incorporation, and your current bylaws, that's where we wanna start. Depending on when you incorporated, there might be language in your letters patent or articles about brothel houses or gaming houses so that stuff we really start to pull it out you don't that was something that was done 50 years ago so uh really we, we do when we get into that kind of amendment like i said with the 130 dollars filing fee we try to clean up as much as we can uh determine what kind of corporation you are start considering what kind of financial reporting you'll have to do in the future um and then take a look at things that might be uh, a problem with your membership. You might need time for approval. I know the time is kind of crunching down, but uh, you know, six months is, is a, still a fair bit of time to, to look at this. I saw a question pop up there, Michelle. Uh, that was Brenda saying, Anka used to say that directors had to step down after six years and take one year off before coming back onto the board. Is that, in there now or has that been removed that's been removed there's no rec there's no uh cap on the number of terms elect a uh, director can sit so you can have somebody for 20 years I, I i could take the bait here sport canada put out a good governance code about 18 months ago talks about capping terms at nine years but that's mandated at the federal level and not necessarily at the local or provincial level but it is kind of the trend in in sport that we're seeing is that we are seeing some organizations cap uh, the number of terms. I call it a double-edged sword. Usually it's, um, you know, maybe we lose somebody who's really valuable to our organization and, and then maybe we can remove somebody who's not so valuable to our organization without, without embarrassment because they've capped their terms out. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword for sure. Um, again, Update your bylaws to comply, have your members approve them, and then do the filing. So you will know you're done when you get your articles of amendment signed and sealed by the government, and then, then you're done. You actually don't have to file your bylaws with the ministry, so uh, don't think you have to. It's just the articles of amendment, and, and, the, and you're done. And Steve, to confirm, the deadline is October 2024? Yes, it's six months from now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, question, why do the bylaws first? I'll tell you, I do that. We do it all together. So we update the way we do the work in house is we will work on your bylaws first, because in order to update your articles, I need to know the definition of your member. I need to know the voting rights and I need to know the dissolution clause. So really what we do is we work on your bylaws and we just literally copy and paste that into your articles. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, if we don't want reference to brothel houses, we could take that out at the time we do the articles of amendment. So the work really is on the bylaws to come up with your definition. Uh, it's actually a good segue to what I wanted to talk about. Now, this is not ONCA specific. This is more just generic governance and sport. I wanted to start thinking a little bit differently about membership. Members do three things. They elect the board they amend the bylaws, they appoint the auditor. Usually from a governance perspective, the board is elected to govern and we let them. 
and the board might have committees or staff or other key volunteers. But when you peel the onion, nobody usually care who's the auditor. We amend the bylaws every three to five years. So what am I really looking at here? I'm looking at who elects the board. And some large organizations, when we talk, particularly in soccer, there's clubs with 6,000, 10,000 members, particularly again in the GTA or Ottawa area, we're seeing organizations with 6,000 members. And again, knowing that seven people come to your AGM, those seven are crucial people. And if I'm an upset parent or an upset participant and I bring 10 of my friends to support my cause, I might have the ability to change the board composition or make other significant changes that nobody expected. So we are actually challenging organizations to look at their membership, decide who they want making those decisions. As a default, we've always done participants or their parents, but really start maybe thinking about it a bit differently. And, and one of the advocacies that we've been proposing is 30 people who are interested in the sport and maybe it's a reflection of your membership, um, recreational participants, house, uh, I say house, like competitive co participants, some coaches, some volunteers, and and really engaging them more into the operations of the club than just the board. That's just something to think about. I'm not a big fan of multiple membership classes. We used to do a lot of that. Um, we used to do that to include everybody. But again, as legislation changes, it, it does bring some significant risks. I'd also have an admission and termination and renewal of membership section in your bylaws. We had one client ended up paying out $1.2 million to a member who hadn't paid their membership fees in four years. And they went to court and they said, well, they're not a member. And what their bylaws said was, if you fail to pay your membership fees, you're a member, not in good standing, but you're still a member. member. So that organization ended up paying a million dollars for an entity that hadn't paid fees in four years. So I like having payment dates. I like having application processes. I like having, uh, you know, describing what that membership year is and the obligation to reapply if you, if you wanted to continue to be a member to draw that line in the sand. Your AGM has to be 15 months of the last AGM and six months of fiscal year end. And again, doing the work that we've been doing, having these conversations with clients, they're going, well, our, AG, our, our members meet, sorry, our fiscal year end is December 31st. We have our members meeting January 14th. I'm like, well, how do you get your financial documents ready in 14 days? How do you work with your accountant? Oh, we show last year's financial statements, not this year's. No, Anka says you must show your fiscal, uh, your financial statements within six months of fiscal year end. So we are working with a lot of our clients to either change the date of their AGM, which sometimes is complicated because we want that new board to come in, you know, with ample opportunity to get the season ready. Um, so maybe it's easier to change the fiscal year end than it is the the membership year. So, uh, yeah, we want notice uh, to be sent to all our organize uh, our members with a description of what's going to be spoken about. The act allows directors to call a, a meeting at any time with notice, and as we spoke about before, members can requisition a meeting with ten percent. Uh, once, if you've ever received that rec uh, that requisition, you have twenty one days to call the meeting. If not, the members can call it within 60 days. Steve, there's a question about the fiscal year end. Um, do we have to be showing audited statements at an AGM that takes place in October 2024 if we haven't yet changed our 2023-2024 year end? I'm saying no. I think once you do the transition, you would then be obligated. So I'm I'm yeah. I'm looking at 2025. Yeah. And that was the case for CKO Sprint as well. So we, um, uh, our AGM was held in November, which was seven and a half months after our fiscal year end. But for next year, it's gonna have to move forward to be within six months because we did after doing the financial statements pass the new bylaws. 
Uh, notice provisions. Identify yep. who will get notice. Uh, let people make informed decisions. Give them as much information if you can as possible. The financial reports, possible amendments or resolutions to be heard. A sample agenda is always helpful. Um, the right to vote by proxy if you allow it. And don't forget, you are legally supposed to invite your accountant, your auditor to your AGM. At least probably about 5% of our clients have the auditor come and present. It's not very common, but it does happen. And legally, you are supposed to invite them. I spoke about who do you want your, your voting members to be? Um, how many votes do you want them to have? One thing we're, ha we're seeing happen, particularly at the club level, is the conversation about families. So if I have six kids in the program, do I get six votes or do I get one? And that's, again, something we've been working, depending on who the client is, they'll say, we only want them to have one. We recognize family entities and not individual membership. Other people have argued, well, we pay for six memberships, so shouldn't we get six votes? I don't really have a, an opinion either way, but I do think you want to have clarity, particularly if somebody has multiple membership classes. They could be a director, they could be a coach, they could be a family member, they could be a member themselves, they could be a parent. Is that four votes or is that one vote? And again, that's something we want to try and define in the legislation. Um, the act states that bylaws should dictate what quorum is. If silent, it's the majority of members. And I, I'm not a big fan of weighted voting, because again, what are we voting on? Really who the board is and what should we be voting on? People who are gonna make decisions in the best interest of the entire organization, not for a specific area of people. So I'm not a big, a big fan of weighted voting, uh, particularly at the club level for sure. Um, board meetings, trying to find how many board meetings you'll have annually, at least a minimum number. How are they called? How is notice provided? A quorum, actually I have to update this slide. It's something I'm still learning too. It's not two fifths. The ONCA used to, sorry, OCA used to say two fifths. It's actually majority under, under ONCA. It's a majority of directors, but no, no less than the minimum defined in your articles, right? We talked about voting, one vote per director. A tie is a defeat because what's a most, the definition of an ordinary resolution is majority. So if it's a tie, it's a defeat. I don't like a director and we'll pick on the president because usually it's the president doesn't vote unless there's a tie. The pre I think it's crazy. The president is the face of an organization. The president has probably the most potential liability on their shoulders and has no say in decisions that are being made unless it's a tie. And when we talk about this with people and board members, they actually have said thank you to us because when there's a tie, you're asking me to side with Michelle and her four directors or Brian and his four directors. So now I've picked half the board and not voted in alliance with them, and they know that. So we really advocate for everyone being equal. The officers, president, treasurer, secretary, they're directors who, to be blunt, do more work. The director, the president is the face, the chair, the, the treasurer is the financial person, the secretary, the notice, the minutes, the meetings. That's more work. So I just don't quite understand why we would ever look at saying to the head face of an organization, you can't make a decision. I, I'm just not a big fan of it. Take a look as you go through this board size. Um, Steve, the there's app. a hand up. There's a hand up from Sarah, I think, on that last one. All right, point. Sarah, go for it. Hi, sorry, my apologies. Uh, I'm from the Warriors of Hope um, Dragon Boat Racing Team here in North Bay. I just had a question about the um, the makeup of a board when you were talking about president, treasurer, and secretary. I noticed something in Anka about uh, a chair and a president, and I just wanted a little bit more description. There seemed to be some confusion on our board about that, so I just wanted to see yeah what information you had about that yeah Thank no you. great question and i didn't talk about it and i should have so the old legislation mandated that every board had a president and a secretary those were the only two officer requirements under the old legislation onca only requires a chair that's it now do i think there's value in having a treasurer and a secretary at minimum of course i do 
because they're responsible for the financial oversight. They're responsible for the document oversight, the calling of meetings, the minutes of meetings. I like seeing those responsibilities being maintained so they don't get forgotten about. But ANCA only requires a chair. And what we say, Sarah, in the bylaws, because a lot of a lot of groups still like to use president, VP, treasurer, secretary. We will say in the officer's description, the president is the chair. And when we do our form one filing, again, when you do your notice of change with the ministry to say, hey, Michelle's leaving the board, Steve's coming in, Brian's coming in, they will, will not let us do the filing if we do not indicate who the chair is. Okay, so, so then my follow-up question for the treasurer position then, for those who already have treasurer, is it better to have a treasurer as part of your board or someone who will join board meetings to do a presentation every now and then? That's a great question. You're full of good questions. Um, you know, I'm seeing it both ways. Most organizations require the officers to be directors. Some larger organizations are not requiring the directors to be officers. They're bringing in people with particular skill sets. A lot of times we're seeing the secretary being managed by a staff person or the uh, treasurer being the CFO of a, of a company, of a, of a sport organization. But again, that's for the larger, the haves, they have staff, they have some resources. I would say for most local clubs, we're still seeing uh, the directors assuming those responsibilities, but legally, Sarah, they don't have to be. And again, when we write bylaws, if we want to include flexibility to say the treasurer does not need to be a director, I you won't hear me fight me. I won't fight you on that ever. Okay, thank you so much. Board composition. As I mentioned before, because of this work and because of the way organizations, of course, they don't like looking at their bylaws. I understand it's not the most exciting document in the planet, but what we're finding is a lot of organizations are coming to us saying, we don't wanna just do the ANCA compliance, we wanna do a governance review. So having a conversation, we really spend our, our time on two areas. Who do you want you to be your members? Who do you want to be voting? And what does your board look like? Do you, have to have a minimum of three if you're are you a working board are you a strategic or a policy advisory board and that's going to dictate your numbers we also talk about terms don't like one-year terms i actually like three-year terms first year you know nothing second year you might understand third year you might get something done it also minimizes transition of the board every year if we have nine and we're turning three people over it's not significant as maybe five and four or nine people. I love a nominations committee. I recognize that it is a ton of work to vet candidates and to do a board assessment and determine what skills and gaps are required to get the right people. But if you have the ability and the energy to do it, I really advocate for it. I have done my share of nominations committee work and I can tell you just reading people's resume, it's not enough. I have one particular story, read this person's resume, loved them, awesome. Huge sport experience, fundraising, marketing, sponsorship, worked in sport, great, check, check, check. Then we met him. His values did not align with ours and did not align with the client. And it would have been a long three years for anybody else who had to sit on that board. He's not a bad person, it's just that his values and the way he, he, he was didn't align. So that's sometimes the work we see in nominations committee. Uh, back to Sarah's point, deciding if your officers are members or the board and who decides. When you indicate that your board composition is president, VP, treasurer, secretary, five directors at large, what you're saying is the members get to pick who the president is. The members get to pick who the financial person is versus electing nine directors at large or just nine directors and then letting the board decide who gets those portfolios. I really like that. It gives people an opportunity. Hi, Michelle, tell me about yourself. What are you interested in? What's your background? What's your experience? What do you want to work in? Oh, I'm, I'm the CFO for my company. Oh, great. You're the treasurer, <laughs> right? Or I love that. So just having the conversation gives you some flexibility rather than relying on the vote of the membership and those people who show up. 
board committees. Uh, we're, we're actually seeing people move away from the executive committee. That was created when boards were 16, 17, 18 people, and we'd have this smaller executive committee make decisions. So we don't see too many of those anymore because of the size of the board. We do like seeing some standing committees, the finance, the governance, the operations, risk management. Again, you can decide whether you embed that in your bylaws or not. And then, of course, you want to know how are your committees appointed or exposed. And please have terms of reference for your committee. Who are they? What are their responsibilities? What's their job description? Can they spend money? What are they? What authority do they have? I really like paperwork, and I hope you never look at it because that means things are going well. But when it's not, you have the ability to go to the I don't know to go to the high performance committee and say, no, it's not your responsibility to pick all the coaches. You are to make recommendations to the board. But again, that's just an example. We talked about uh, financials and the fiscal year. I'm just cognitive of time. Um, I just want to show you one more slide about corporate compliance. Here it is. So these are the financial, oh, sorry, financial. These are the corporate documents that you are to have accessible. Your articles, your bylaws, your minutes of meetings of members and committee of members, resolutions, minutes of directors meetings, resolutions of directors, a list of your directors, a list of your officers, a list of your members, your accounting records. And what's really interesting, what's in red is accessible to the members. And what's an important thing here that they don't have access to? Board minutes. The fiduciary and legal responsibility of a director is far greater than a member. And the decisions that you make as a board are sometimes confidential. When we talk about the inclusion of a transgender athlete or a human rights complaint or litigation or an ongoing complaint at a board meeting is not for public consumption. Now, one thing that one of our clients does, which I really like, is after every board meeting, they put out a notice to their members and they say, hey, we had a board meeting last night and here's all the relative information that you should know about. Doesn't mean you need to know everything, but that way there's that communication between the board and the membership. You'll also notice that a list of members is accessible to people. Yes, this trumps privacy. Yes, this trumps PAPIDA, privacy legislation. But in order to get a membership list, you have to sign an affidavit sworn in front of a commissioner to indicate what you're going to do with that list. It has to be for corporate purposes. In 22 years of practice, I've seen it happen twice. It doesn't happen very often. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention because I know there's a lot of queries about board minutes and I want to see your minutes and you don't have to. I actually had one client argue with me, oh, we're transparent, we'll share everything. And they wrote into their bylaws, board minutes will be open to the public, open to the membership. And uh, two months later, I get a phone call saying, hey, Steve, somebody wants the minutes. We don't want to give them to them. I wanted to say, I told you so without saying, I told you so. Go ahead, Michelle. I saw a question come in. Um, it's from Sherry. Can you describe what should be in bylaws? Um, wow. uh, for example, voted on by members versus standing rules, policies, and procedures. Yeah. Um, for example, documented operational board decisions. So I have a very linear opinion on governance and bylaws. I think your bylaws should be who's my member, how do they vote, how do they apply, how do we get rid of them, who's my board, how are they elected, what's the length of their term, how do I call a members meeting, how do I call a board meeting, done. Have I talked about paddling? Have I talked about, you know, sport? No because I truly believe that the members should elect a board to govern and we let them. And if you don't like the way the boards are being run, vote in the new board. But to have to go to your members to ask their permission for operational issues, it's just, you, you'll be walking through wet sand your entire, mm -hmm. your entire career. I was with a client out in BC, we actually did bylaw amendments. And I usually stay till the end of the members meeting to be polite and I'll wait till it's over before I leave. And 
they said, okay, motion number one uh, to change the baseballs from pink to blue. And I nudged the executive director and I said, uh, what are you doing? He said, we're doing operational changes. I said, how many do you have? He said, 86. I said, I'm leaving. So I don't like that. I think it is the board's responsibility to make decisions in the best interests of, of your members, of your participants. And you know, we say we see this all the time, not so much on the operational side, but particularly membership fees. The members will approve the membership fees. Oh, financial reporting. Oh, I see we have a five hundred thousand dollars in a GIC. I vote we don't have membership fees this year. And everyone goes, That's a great idea. I well, you've got that five hundred thousand for these crazy things like called COVID that shut us down for two years that we need money or you're trying to invest in a high performance program or coach education or you want to build um, a, a club, you know, whatever it is. So I, I really advocate for the board to govern, that the board have the ability to oversee ops and rules and regulations and policies. And again, remember those three things, members elect the board, amend the bylaws, appoint the auditor done that's my opinion here's my oh sorry one more uh, a couple of things just you should be aware of some of your filings so you, as we mentioned before if you're not incorporated or you're not protected as a division of um, i would for sure look at incorporation i think it's from a liability perspective it's a no-brainer annual general meeting 15 months of last year's within six months of fiscal year end. And after you have your AGM, your board changes over, make sure you file your annual return. If you make a change after your annual general meeting, you're looking at a notice of change. That's your head office address, that's your official email, that's the board composition, the people who are on the boards. You should be doing your taxes, your T2 return. Um, you should have your bylaws. You're supposed to have mandatory policies for workplace safety, privacy, and accessibility. And please make sure you have adequate insurance, I beg of you. And the other thing I would also say is please keep a copy of those policies. We had a client um, get sued about six months ago for an incident that occurred in 1985. And the insurer at the time is the one who provides coverage, not the insurance of today. So we were able to track down the insurer of that organization to 1986. I couldn't find the previous insurer. So that liability falls on the organization without insurance because we don't know who it was. So please mm -hmm. keep that as part of your corporate documents. Um, to be included in your uh, retention plans. And the only thing we always say, how long should we keep things? Everyone says six years, seven years. That is your financial documents. Okay? There, is no, um, there is no statute of limitations on all of this other stuff. You should be maintaining this in perpetuity. If you can, um, scan it, put it on a little key, and don't leave it in the basement to get you know, flooded as with the rest of your paper, your paper documents. I'm going to post my contact information. I saw some questions, Michelle, yep. but uh, I will post my contact information. Um, you could also reach out to Mike and Olivia who are on the call tonight. If you have any concerns, um, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint. I'll send it to you right after we're done, Michelle. Perfect. But again, Thank if you. anybody has questions that they didn't ask or don't feel comfortable asking tonight, uh, pop us a note. We'll, we'll figure that out. Okay. There's a couple in the chat. And then if anyone wants to put up their hand and, and come in for further questions. So there's a, a question from Heidi. Um, do you include financial decisions over a set amount in your bylaws to be decided by the membership? For example, any expense over a certain amount needs a membership vote. Do so, yeah, we've done that before. I mean, we'll say something again that's subjective. The numbers sometimes it's around a hundred thousand dollars, depending on the the sport, where the board can't spend that without membership approval. I would probably take it out. I do like the idea of putting it into policy rather than bylaws. 
particularly when we want to change the amount. So mm. I do think it's important to have that. I just don't think I want to see it in bylaws. I'd like to see it in a financial and a finance policy. Okay. Um, and there's a note, just a note from Sherry saying that she filed notice of change and it cost $290 to file. And they ended up having to pay twice because there was something they had to change and had to reopen a submission and file it twice. Hey, so Sherry, I don't okay. know who did that and who you paid, but that sounds excessive. Um, so if you need support moving forward, let me know. Okay. Any questions from anyone about any of the any of the content that Stephen went over or anything that that wasn't in the presentation that you want to ask a question about and, and maybe that your club's struggling with? stop presenting and you can all see each okay. other yeah good okay i don't see anything anybody else jumping in are clubs generally at the front end of this process or are some sort of largely through the process and getting ready to file Hi, Michelle. I was just going to say, I, I Rio, um, Steve's helped us and it's been very helpful. Thank you. We have a, a set of like a draft to review and just reviewing that within a committee and hoping to file the the question is just when that I find is that whole debate about AGM. When do we make the AGM? Because how does backing up the f fiscal year impact the busyness of the club so that that is still tbd yeah yeah we, I, many of us have our fiscal year before a season starts and use our agms to sort of close off a season in the fall and those timelines get challenging for us mm -hmm. is that what you know of other clubs do though they have their fiscal year close like in the spring yeah then, well April 1st, March 31st. Um, and then, you know, we at CKO, we're doing a November AGM and that's too big of a gap. Mm -hmm. So if we keep the fiscal year at April 1st, we have to move the AGM into September, which is still yeah, busy. hard to get ready for. Yeah. So Gan is saying in the chat that this is their first introduction to the process um uh richmond hill um uh is in the process and working with steve and yeah it is a lot mm -hmm. um uh through ecore sherry oh yeah uh, used okay uh, and sncc is at the at the front end of the process as well so people are at, at different stages yeah there's Michelle? a couple there's a sorry, Michelle. There's a couple um, search companies like Encorp. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. They they make their money. Yeah, yeah. Michelle, you wanna had a question? Michelle, you're. I don't know if you're on mute, but I'm not hearing you. Thank you. Um, there you go. I'm with SNCC as well. We're having an AGM in the next month but my question is if we're working on our bylaws and we're working on filing and the deadline is in october we have to have another agm then prior to filing yeah you'd have to have what we would call a special meeting of the members and okay. for that for that michelle a special meeting of the members is, is called for an intended purpose so we would call it to ratify the onca compliant bylaws and the articles of amendment you know, if you if we do a good job with it, it, it should be a 10 minute meeting. Right. OK. And with electronic um, meetings now, there's no obligation for everyone to come to the club. You could do it on Zoom. And, uh, you know, really, uh, as the questions kind of where every describing where everybody is, I, I I've done this a few times, obviously. And I wish there was an easier way. I wish there was a package I could give all 30 of you and say, just take this package and put your name on it. 
And unfortunately, it can't because you all have different articles of incorporation. You all have different board compositions. You all have different membership definitions. So it, it does become a bit complicated that way. Um, so that's why it, it is hard. And I, I wish I could bottle it up for you, but I just, I just don't know how. Can I ask? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just a quick, um, just to recap on that director and officer. So the director are all the members, and then the officer are the ones that have titles like treasurer, commodore, vice commodore, secretary. So I would call those. Yeah, those would be the officers, Fiona. That's, right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And you were saying, Steve, that the the you can have a secretary and a treasurer who are not voting directors on your board. Uh, yep. The only requirement is the chair has to be a director. Okay. It's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. okay. Um, well, Steve has provided his email address. If there's follow-up, we will circulate around to all those who registered to attend tonight the um, presentation from Steve so that you can have a look at it. We have recorded the call as well. Um, so I think um, uh, we'll we'll make that available because um, I think it will be helpful as other members of your board are, are struggling with this. Uh, Gan has another hand up. I don't know who that is, but the Gan Anakwe, did you want to jump in? Yep, go ahead. They're muted. Yeah. Gan, we're not we're not hearing you if you're talking. Sorry, I was just looking for the contact information, but I did find it. You found it? Okay. Yeah, Good. thank you. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, I hope the call has been helpful uh, to those at all stages in the process as we work through this uh, for the coming deadline. Um, I'm available as well. Um, you can find my um, email address. I think I have another email address, which is admin at cksprint.ca. Um, that you can reach me at. And we went through the process as CKO Sprint last year and happy to um, happy to share our experiences and, and some of the things we wrestled with very much as we looked at both the requirements of ANCA and some of the new trends coming down um, from the federal government in sport governance on things like athlete seats on the board and things like that, which aren't required by ANCA, but are also emerging as some of the, the best practices in sport governance. So I'm um, happy to talk with anyone about any of those. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, Steve. everybody. Appreciate Thanks. your time tonight. Thank you for, for putting this on and everybody Thanks. enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> like what the actual